Welcome to the Wheelbarrow Profits Podcast, where you get multifamily investing made real. Learn from top players in the real estate investment world as they share their secrets with you and discover proven strategies on apartment investing that actually work. To learn more about Wheelbarrow Profits, visit jakeandgino.com, your one-stop shop for everything multifamily. Now to your hosts, Jake and Gino. Hello, everybody. This is Jake Stenziano, host of the Wheelbarrow Profits Podcast, here with my co-host, the multifamily mentor, the coach, chef, the father, six, the best-selling author, the G-Daddy. Gino Barbo, Gino, how's it going? I'm doing good, Jake. How you doing, bro? Always making it happen, big man. And, uh, and as you know, this is where we would normally plug something to pay the bills. Now, for our listeners, we only showcase products and services that we approve or use in our own business. G-Dad, what you got? Mr. Stenziano, we've been working hard at growing the community of like-minded investors and the results of our members has been nothing short of incredible, bro. We're looking to grow this amazing group of investors. What we're looking for is those who want to follow our proven framework that we've created, the, you know, the buy right, the manage right, the finance right, you know, leverage our connections, our education and mentorship as ways to take their business to the next level. So guys, if you're interested in finding out more, you want to be a part of this amazing community, apply to work with us at jakeandgino.com. Enough shameless plugging for now. Let's get to the show. Today's guest is Andrew Campbell. Andrew is a native Austinite and real estate entrepreneur who broke into the real estate investing scene. It's a passive investor in 2009. In 2012, he transitioned into active investing and management of a personal portfolio that he grew to 76 units across Austin and San Antonio. He earned his stripes building and managing his personal portfolio before moving into larger multifamily buildings. So without further ado, Andrew, welcome to the show. Hey guys, thanks for having me. Hey man, thanks for being here. Tell us, uh, tell us about that personal portfolio, the 76 units. What, uh, what was that comprised of and, uh, and how'd you get started in, uh, with that? Yeah, I mean, that was, uh, that was all duplexes and fourplexes for the most part. There were a handful of single families in there that were kind of bought out of foreclosure. Uh, but really, I think the, the story and kind of how we got into investing in real estate, you know, started kind of in that 2009 framework as a passive investor. And even sort of the year before that, um, I grew up in Austin. I was living out of state and my dad had a, a big brain hemorrhage and I moved home and kind of ended up taking six months off, uh, kind of help him, you know, back to health and get through some rehab and, at that time, sort of, you know, I was 27 years old at the time, kind of evaluating life and realizing that I needed to go create some passive income that I just was sort of at that point on that corporate, you know, ladder. The goal at the time was be, you know, corporate VP uh, of, of, you know, whatever. And um, just, just, you know, realize like, okay, that's not a, that's not a path that's going to create any flexibility. And we needed to create some, some more just flexibility in life. So that's what launched us into the space and really kind of gave us a really solid why around wanting to go create passive income. Um, and then we just kind of steadily built out the portfolio and had some dumb luck along the way, you know, buying in Austin and, and, you know, between 09 and, and even today has been a phenomenal run. So it's been very helpful. Um, but it was kind of just reevaluating life and wanting some lifestyle changes that, that led us into the space. Can you talk about that first deal you did? Did you do it by yourself where you had partners? Did you have mentors? Walk us through that first deal. Yeah, the, the first that so that whole first 75 units, my brother and I, when I say we, you know, we were kind of doing it together in parallel. Uh, we were doing you know, residential financing in our own name. So I'd have some and he had some in his name. Uh, we did not raise any money from anybody, but we did certainly have mentors and good teams. You know, one of uh, I always joke that real estate sort of like crack and you know we got addicted and my, my crack dealer, my initial dealer was this <laughs> was friend, friend, family friend of mine who when we were kind of going through everything and I'd moved home, he gave me Gary Keller's real uh, millionaire real estate investor. And was just kind of, you know, imploring me to, Hey, look at this stuff. You know, I think you want to go do it. He owned a few duplexes at the time and uh, really kind of walked us through. He was selling a duplex for a client that was right next door to the one, one that he owned and said, look, buy this deal. I'll help you out. We'll I'll help you kind of rehab it. I got you know contractors. And so really the whole thing was just draft off his playbook and, and certainly having a really good mentor uh, that, that got us going. So what were the, do you remember the numbers on the first, on the first deal you did? Yeah, absolutely. We, we, uh, we bought it for 212,000. Uh, we put about 20,000 in rehab into it. So we kind of came in completely updated the kitchens, put all in tile, you know, again, basically everything you recommended doing, you want to do tile for, you know, rent to rent property. You don't want any carpet and, 
Um, we, it's been, a, it's, it, you know, we skip ahead kind of our, our greatest deal ever. Uh, that's probably been it. You know, we've been able to number one, learn that and see the business model, but pulled out equity on it once we bought some more We're actually in the process of selling it now. Cause there's just so much equity on the table and we've, we're totally, you know, shifting our focus more into the larger deals, but, uh, it was, you know, not a huge $212,000 purchase that's just paid for itself kind of two or three times over. How, uh, how long did it take you to get your second deal? Uh, the next month. So we closed on a fourplex the next month. I think when we, you know, between 09 and when we started buying in 11, 12, you know, we did a lot of reading, educating and just felt like, you know, sat on the fence long enough. And once we jumped in, uh, it was go time. It's funny, Jake. One of my favorite quotes is from Jay Scott. And in real estate, you either have zero deals or you have a lot of deals. Nobody has one deal, right? So um, it's so true. Talking about crap, you can't hit the pipe once, deal I guess. Deal junkie in the house, right? You got a deal junkie over there. <laughs> right? So my, my point to that is it gets to be really addictive. It's really scary. You're really fearful. You're crapping your pants. Jake's got, you know, can't sleep at nighttime. He's in the closing <laughs> the next day. He's calling me up going, man, I can't believe we're doing this. But then when you get over the fear and you close, we did the same thing. Three months later, we got another deal going. And, and how is that possible? It takes you 18 months to get your first deal. Then three months, you're in your second deal. Then six months, you're in a, a deal that's the deal of your lifetime. So my only point to that is get out there, whether it's a duplex, whether it's a little crappy single family home, get your first deal, make it work for you. And then all of a sudden, you're off to the races. I mean, that, that, that sounds like the blueprint you, you took, Andrew, correct? Absolutely. It absolutely is. And I'd say that the, the crap in your pants doesn't stop when you close. I mean, I, I remember pulling up to that first property after we closed and it was kind of a, a class C fourplex. And you know, that we were I'm like, how, what am I doing now? Like I got to go now talk to these people, tell them I'm your new <laughs> landlord, you know, introduce myself. Here's how we're going to pay rent. I and mean, I was terrified. I was like, what have we just done? So it, obviously you get over it and you get to the point where it's, you know, second nature and you figure out how to manage people and talk to the, your residents. But yeah, it's, you, you learn by doing for sure. And this is another shameless plug. This is why we, we put this academy together because something like Andrew, if he had the academy and had the trainings and had the tenant takeover letter and had the due diligence documents and had the application forms and had the lead-based paint addendum, if it was set pre-78, I could keep going on and on. That's a lot of stuff when you're fearful. And maybe you don't need to know all that in the beginning, but it would be nice to have the, those resources. So um, I credit a lot of that to you know mentors that I had. So um, Ignorance is bliss, you know, right? <laughs> Ignorance could kill you, my friend. You know what I'm saying? So Unless you know, <laughs> you want to have a little bit, it. you need to have a little bit because if you, know, you, you'll never know everything, that little bit of ignorance is okay. But when you have a lot of ignorance is when you, when it's going to die. So how did you find that second deal? Let's talk about the second deal. Cause the first deal was put you on the map, but let's talk about the second deal. How'd you find it? Uh, MLS. I mean, it was same working with the same mentor, you know, we said, all right, we've, we've, we've done the duplex and kind of as that was getting ready to close, we were already looking for the next one. Um, and, it was a, you know, again, buying at the right time in Austin, uh, found a good property. I mean, our, our number one rule was always cash flow. And it was sort of like the, everybody talks about the 2% rule. I think realistically th these were 1% or better. And that was kind of my goal. If I could beat the 1% rule, I felt comfortable even making mistakes and not really know what I was going to do when they did cash flow. Um, and so, you know, we found it on MLS and closed on it the next month. And then I think by the end of that year, it's so probably four or five months later, we had our, our second fourplex. So we were at 10 units in that first year. Do you remember what the differences were in the market back then as opposed to now? Not just cap rate compression and all that, but I mean, occupancy, the ability to get loans and all that. How is it different back then than it is now for you? I think occupancy has always been pretty, pretty stable here. I mean, Austin's been a, a really good market. Um, so I haven't, haven't worried too much about that. And I think on the smaller properties, you know, my, my strategy has always been, you know, stay below market on rents and have very, very little turnover. Um, and I think one of the reasons we've transitioned into the bigger properties is they operate more efficiently. You know, the have it going through a turn on that duplex just, you know, cripples you for a, there goes a whole year's worth of, of cash flow. So I would have, you know, in some of these properties that we were just now trading out of have gone three, four, five years without any vacancy. Um, and so intentionally would just make sure we, we would push the rents every year, but the goal was to have zero, zero vacancy. Um, so I didn't worry too much about kind of market stats and looking at it on that, on that sense. Um, on the financing side, and we were doing, we started out doing all, you know, personal residential 30 year loans. Um, you know, and that's again, one, I think another reason we transitioned into the bigger properties, we came up against that. You can only get 10 of those. 
so, so once you hit that, you're used to that 30 year fixed rate money. You start looking at commercial financing and the terms get a lot shorter and, and, you know, floating rates. And, um, you know, we had to evaluate what the strategy was going to be as we were approaching that barrier. What was your aha moment about, wow, big properties make more sense to me. Um, I think it, it was a sort of organic a little bit as we sort of built out the, the portfolio and we saw that, you know, mentioned having a, a turnover at a duplex just killed you, you know, turnovers and vacancies in, in single families just, you know, are, are just destroy you. The fourplexes were a little bit better. We had a 10 unit that, that did better, you know, so it was, uh, the, the bigger we saw it, the bigger they were, the better they performed, the more they could withstand, you know, some expenses, some, some vacancy. And I think as we really looked at back to that sort of being addicted and wanting to go do more deals and figuring, like, okay, this is definitely the path for me for the rest of my life. I'm going to, I'm leaving the corporate world. You sort of get, get your head around the idea that I, I, it makes sense. A hundred unit a 200 unit is going to be much more efficient to operate. You know, it's going to be scarier to jump into that space and raise money, but it's going to be a, a, an efficient property and, and you can see how it just scales and works better. Did you, Andrew, uh, when you first started out, were you, were you completely out of the corporate world or are you still working a job and doing real estate? I was still working. Yeah. I, it, it took me, um, I guess we bought our first one in, in 11. I, I left my job last year. So it, uh, it took, you know, four or five years. So what was the thought behind uh, leaving the job? I mean, how did you come to that? Because a lot of guys always ask me, I'm making just about enough money. When should I take the leap? What, what, how did, what made you feel comfortable about leaving your job? I think it was, it was a couple of things. Number one, it was just that where, where was my energy and passion going? You know, I was, I was working two full-time jobs. I was staying up every night and, you know, looking for deals and spending time on growing that real estate business. And that's where a lot more of my just energy and, and excitement was coming from. Um, and I think tied to that, you know, I had a, a conversation with my wife at, at Christmas time sort of two years ago and, you know, just looking at the year ahead and the year behind us. And she just said, you're really kind of a miserable bastard. You know, you need to go do this real estate thing. And, it was kind of very, you know, awesome to have her support of, you need to go do this, but we kind of mapped out and said, look, we've got X amount coming in on the, on the real estate. It, it all just about pays for our, what we need, but we've got some savings, like go, go try this. Let's go give it a go. And at that point we sort of mapped out the plan for, you know, leaving our job at some point in that year and, and, you know, giving it a go in the, in the bigger space, which we've done and, and been, been pretty successful at. So what happened right after you left? I mean, any, anything changing in your life as far as paradigm shifts, as far as more opportunities coming into your life, more enjoyment, exp, exp, describe that process. Night and day. Uh, I mean, it's just been, the, it's the best decision I've ever made. I always encourage people, you know, if, if you're thinking about it, if you have the means, you know, bet on yourself, take the leap, even, I, I'd probably say I might even, you know, jumped a little bit ahead of schedule, right? I'd, I wasn't completely replacing my income. I was making you know, quite a bit of money in my corporate job. Uh, but it's been the best decision of the, the, the quality of life, you know, the ability to sort of architect your day and kind of live this life by design. Uh, it's been, it's been unbelievable. You know, it, it's certainly fueled the real estate business. I mean, when you have sort of unlimited time and energy to focus on, you know, building the relationships and finding the deals, I couldn't have gone, you know, this quickly or had this much you know, focus if I was trying to balance a, a day job that I was just miserable banging my head against the wall at. So Andrew, Jake was in a Taco Bell parking lot. I was in the kitchen of my restaurant. Where were you when you gave him the pink slip? <laughs> uh, I, I was I was actually at the office, um, you know, and and just said, "Hey, what's going on with you?" And I said, "I'm out." You know, it's like I'm not even get, like, yeah. Let's uh, let, let, let's wrap this up. <laughs> and they said, "What do you mean? You are crazy?" I mean, what was their what was their reaction? Uh, you know, it was it was it's corporate. They don't give a shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, and they, they, I think they knew it was coming. I mean, my, 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 as my energy was going more and more towards it and mentally we had made that decision, it was, it was apparent. I was, it was time. And had you at this point transitioned into uh, bigger deals? Let's talk about transitioning into the bigger deals. How did you think about it? What were your steps to get into it? Were you buying them yourself? Were you raising capital? Let's go into that whole framework because I think that's where some investors, that's where they want to go to and they don't know how to start to do that. Yeah. So, it, you know, when, when we made the decision to, you know, I mentioned we were coming up against the end of our you know, runway as far as getting those residential loans, um, you know, realizing that the bigger stuff scaled better, operated more efficiently. We just decided we were going to jump into that big, you know, operate, go buy, you know, call hundred plus unit deals. Um, we had never raised money. So we, you know, had to go really study up and learn sort of how to do, how to do that. You know, my number one rule is I don't want to go to jail. 
uh, number one. And number two, like there's a huge responsibility if we're going to start raising money. We had, I'd say, you know, quite a bit of, of experience and, and track record. And since we did have 75 units, we'd operated deals. I, I understood the metrics and sort of how to look at a building and see if it was going to be a, a good deal. But taking on that sort of burden and responsibility of, you know, taking other, other people's money, um, not something that you want to do lightly. So we, you know, just started looking into that space and studying up on, you know, what we would need to do from the SEC perspective, from the legal perspective. Um, and then just started, you know, networking with brokers and said, look, here's who we are. Here's our story. Here, here's what we're looking for. And we've, we've been looking in, in Austin and San Antonio where we grew up and where our portfolio was um, and started just being very intentional about our conversations with, you know, our friends, our network and, and start getting the word out that we're going to go do this now and, and raise money um, and, and just kind of, you know, take one deal at a time. How long did it take you to get that first deal? Um, before, that first big deal when you, when you left the corporate? Uh, so it was about five months. So I left my job last June. We closed on a deal end of November um, okay. in San Antonio's 100 and 192 unit deal. So a pretty good size deal, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, call it five months. And how, and how long did it take you to raise the money and how much money did you have to raise for that deal? So we raised about 6.3 million. Um, you know, we did that in sort of the standard 60, 70 day time frame. you know, from the time we got it awarded to getting it closed. So what is your, what, I guess, what do you, um, as far as giving advice, what would you tell people that are out there trying to raise money for the first time? What would you tell them? Uh, be intentional, you know, be intentional every single day that you've got to be building relationships. I tell people all the time, like I'm no longer in the real estate business. I'm in the relationship business. So it, at, at our company at Wildhorn, my focus is acquisition. So building relationship with the brokers and owners to make sure we're seeing all the deals and it's in relationships with potential investors. And that's, I've got a goal of five meetings per week, you know, five new people that I'm reaching out to and having a, a personal conversation or face to face on the phone. Um, you've got to be constantly out talking to people and just being open about what you're doing and, and not being afraid that it's not, I'm not a sales guy by any means, but I think there's a, a stigma that you're, I don't want to go you know, sell people and I don't want to you know, be raising money. It's like, well, I'm just sharing what we're doing and creating opportunities for people to, to come join up with us. It's funny because we just talked about Cardone a couple of minutes ago and it's either sell or be sold, baby. You know what I'm saying? You're yeah. either selling or you're being sold. So um, when you go out there and you create those relationships, you like that yaki boom boom, huh? <laughs> you're out there. I mean, it, it is, it's, it's, it's really daunting out there. How do you keep yourself, I guess, motivated? Because I have a partner. I mean, Jake is great. I mean, you know, we get our Monday morning calls. We keep ourselves accountable. How do you keep yourself accountable to making those five calls every week? Because it, it can get tough. I mean, you have Memorial Day weekend. You have a rough week. You're sick. Your kids, this and that. How do you keep yourself on schedule and on tap? Uh, I think some of it comes back like, look, this is my full-time job. That's my full-time focus. Um, you know, so that's, and I love what I do. I mean, I, I absolutely love the the business model that we execute, the opportunity that it creates. So when I'm out, you know, having conversations with people, I'm always asking, not, not in a salesy way, but you know, who else do you know? And following up with people and just, you know, go into those happy hours, those meetups, you know, we, when you don't want to say, look, I, I need to, I need to sort of go do this and get out of my introvert shell a little bit and, and just tell people, you know, what I'm doing, what I'm about. Let's talk about the business model. How do you guys analyze deals? What are you looking for in a deal? Um, and I guess, you know, I guess talk about the markets and what really excites you about the markets you're in. Yeah. I mean, our, our business model, I, I kind of describe it's pretty down the fairway as far as value add, you know, we're looking for, you know, hundred, hundred plus unit buildings that have a, a good story. You know, if I go back to, I've got a marketing background and advertising degree from the University of Texas. I'm looking for what's the story with this property? You know, who's owned it? How long have they had it? Why are they selling it? Um, and then, you know, kind of what, what are the opportunities for us to go execute your know, value add strategies? I think that you see so much right now where they say, oh, it's a value add, but they've, they've sucked all the value out of it. And they just want you to sort of continue on with the, the little bit of meat that's on the bone. Um, you know, we're looking, looking for deals that I describe it as a hybrid of, you know, fix and flip and in long-term hold. So we're looking for, you know, a five-year type hold where we can cash flow from day one. We can make, you know, good, good cash flow distributions and then also sell it in five years where we've capitalized on the appreciation that we've, we've created and forced. So that's, that's kind of what we're looking for, you know, class B workforce housing. And what, what cap rates are you finding in the market? And what, I guess, typical cash on cash or IR returns do you, are you, are you targeting now? 
So cash on cash returns, you know, we'd like to see something that's close to 9%, um, you know, and that it's going to be a little bit lower when we go in as we execute some of our, our plans, um, you know, an IRR of kind of 15 plus percent. I mean, I, I don't focus too much on IRR. And I think when we talk with, with our, you know, investors, it's like our, our plan is to, again, distribute those cash flows and, and, you know, we have an 8% preferred return. So we need to hit at least 8% with, with our cash flows, but our, our plan is to double your money in five years. So we look at what's that equity multiple going to look like. And that typically equates to a 15, 16, 17% IRR, but we're not too focused on what that exact number is. It's more of, does it cash flow day one? And is there a clear story on how we can go force depreciation and, and upside? Andrew, uh, why don't you give me an example of how you talk to an investor? Because uh, we're going into the syndication model right now, and I've got guys who've got these beautiful PowerPoints. You can read them and you like you get lost in the weeds. And I've got guys that say, just keep it simple. Don't even talk about IRR. I mean, where do you fall in, in, in that? I think it's some of it's know your audience, you know, so who is it that you're talking to as you're sitting down, you know, if you're having coffee with somebody and, and if it, is it somebody that, that likes the details, there, there's, there's three components of every deal the way we think about it. There's, there's the deal itself, there's the market and there's the team, mm -hmm. right? And different people are going to be more interested in, in different things. I think more often than not, people are looking at, at us as the team, you're kind of betting on a horse and they want to know, you know, who are we, what's our track record? Let's talk about our property management offering and who our group is that we use. We do third party management. I think that's critical. Um, so always talk a lot about, you know, our team, you know, kind of who we've surrounded ourselves with and what our, our, our that piece of it looks like. And then, you know, just reading our, is it somebody that really wants to get into the financials and see our pro forma and look at the cash flows? Or is it more of, it's more of that qualitative, you know, marketing story? Well, here's, here's why we like it. You know, this, this owner's had it for 10 years. They haven't updated it. We've got these four or five value add strategies. Um, you know, I typically err on more of just keeping it simple. And if somebody really wants the details and numbers, you know, they'll follow up or we can kind of get into it. But I don't lead with IRR with, you know, return projections with NOI numbers. It's, it's, um, but that's, I think you got to leverage your background in what your strengths are. I'm a marketing guy. I think, I think in qualitative, you know, what's the story with this and that's how I evaluate deals. And I think that's how I kind of present them. I, I like that. How have you, um, how did you find this, this most recent deal you're closing in a couple of weeks and what was the, I guess, value added? What was the attractive portion to this deal? So it, it's, we've gotten the, the, both of our last two deals are from the same seller that, which is, it's a REIT. Um, and we've kind of built up a good relationship with them. We've obviously performed on a deal. They, they know who we are. Uh, what we like about it is, is what I just mentioned is, is the exact story. So they've had it for 10 years, their loans coming due their REIT. So their, their business model is to operate and not improve. So it's kind of a blank canvas for us. There, there's not a ton of deferred maintenance but they haven't done, you know, upgrades on the interiors. They haven't executed, you know, value uh, trash valets or reserve parking or a lot, you know, pet yards, a lot of the, the basic kind of strategies that we look for. Um, so we, we got this deal after we closed on the other one, you know, we knew this one was coming and it was coming out. So we had a little bit of a leg up and a head start as far as getting into it before everybody else did. Um, and it was in a very, very similar area, two miles from the other deal in San Antonio. So it was, it was a market that we knew very well, a sub market that we knew very well from a seller that we knew. Um, and it just, you know, had a good relationship and, and got the numbers to work. You guys, I, I like the assets that you have. I mean, I've been reading, um, online as far as Amazon, as far as amenities, what amenities are you looking for to put into your properties as far as maybe Amazon lockers or, you know, updated nest uh, thermostats and any kind of stuff. What kind of stuff are you guys looking at doing in those properties that you have <laughs> yeah we've talked a lot about the the amazon lockers and and um i know in, in one of our comps recently put one in you know we're trying to figure out is it i was on property a couple of weeks ago and have a picture of you know, our manager's office with like 50 packages and mm -hmm. it's like that's just this morning you know we're gonna get more this afternoon and so we're trying to figure out what's the roi of, of your staff's time you know that's that's not an amenity that has a direct ROI to it from an ownership perspective, yeah. but there is just the, the number one, it's a, we'd use it as a marketing tool, but what's the, how much time does that free up from our leasing staff to follow up on leads to be out there, you know, messaging the property. So uh, we haven't done it yet. We're definitely looking at it. I think, you know, is, is it the right, are you in the right market and the right property type that would warrant it? I mean, everybody's buying online, so it's not like, you know, it doesn't matter. If I, you're just, in class I just or don't class. like the fact that they want the money up front right now. Like if they, because it's a lease, but they were like, give me 10 grand right now. 
And I'm, I'm like, you know, if you, sp- if you spread that out monthly, we would look at it much more closely because I want it. I think it's, I think it's hip. I think it's cool. I think people want it and I think they'll use it. I don't know that someone's going to rent from you because you have it, but it sure, it does not hurt. Right. So yeah. I, I really want them. I just don't, I don't like the, the terms right now of their agreements. They're just, they're stocking you up front for a big nut. Well, I feel like, I mean, the, the, the carriers should subsidize you. I mean, if you think about what they're supposed to do is they're supposed to go knock on every single door. And if they're not home, then bring it to the office. I think a lot of times they're just dumping it at the office. But if I, if I save them you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes on site, if they deliver in 15, 20 packages, two or three times a day, what's that worth to their business? How much more efficient do they good run? Luck, good luck with that, man. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Well, it's amazing. I, I, I was reading stuff this weekend about Amazon and it's amazing that they make you pay to put their stuff in to get their packaging. So they're, they're genius. They're genius marketers. They're pay, you're paying for their stuff. That's number one. Number two, 90 million households. It's not United. just for theirs though, Gino. It's for, it's for any, yeah. But that's what I'm saying. But they, they're, they're controlling. They have two different ones yeah. where they, you get just their packages and then they have another one that ships out uh, FedEx. The hub. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, places like New York City where they don't have doormen, uh, smaller markets, but they can't even put it in a lot of these apartment buildings because they have to be ADA compliant. So that's the other challenge. But there's definitely certain cities that work with it. But 90 million households have Amazon Prime. That's almost 70% of the households in the United States have Amazon Prime. So, I mean, it's just to them, it's just an amazing business model. Um, I didn't want to get off the topic, but I know Amazon is just going to be huge. They're the, they're the monster. And I just want to you know, educate people about it because it's coming. And if you don't have it, like Andrew said, it might not be worth it intangibly, but if the guy on the street has it and there's a difference between your place and their place, they might go with the Amazon locker place. So, um, Andrew, any, yeah. other, any other value? There are Amazon addicts out there too. This guy's a deal junkie, but then they're they, like, there's Amazon addicts too. So, you know what I mean? Everyone's got their like vice. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Any other value adds that you guys are looking at in, on, on property? Uh, you know, there, there's a, a standard list. We always want to see, you know, how many pet yards could become put in, you know, those private pet yards to get, you know, $100, $80 a month, uh, how flat, you know, how, so we, we're always looking for those trash valet is something that we've been putting in and seeing, you know, take pretty well in kind of that class B space, uh, you know, covered in reserved parking. You, you, you mentioned kind of the nest thermostat you know, we, we've, we haven't done it yet, but we've talked about, and I've, I've seen a couple operators, you know, charge for sort of a tech amenity package where they'd give you sort of a Nest thermostat, a USB outlets, even a Bluetooth front door lock for, you know, 20, 30 bucks a month. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, we, have, we haven't we have done Nests yet, but I, that's another one where it definitely changes the perception of your property, right? And I think if you're in the right, look, trying to attract the right tenant base, it, it's worthwhile doing and it, it lowers your, your bills. Wow, I, I love that. How have you, um, I guess, been able to build out your teams as this has been going on and as you're scaling up from uh, smaller properties to these uh, bigger units? Uh, so I, I think I got really fortunate as we were kind of getting into this, you know, finding the right partner and, and really understanding out of the get go, you know, much like you guys, that this is a total team sport and you can't go do big deals all by yourself, at least at a, at a, at a decent velocity and pace. There's just too many components from, you know, asset management and, and, and underwriting and managing the property like you guys are doing to finding the equity, finding the deals. There's just, there's just investor relations. There's so many different hats you got to wear. Um, so I've got, I've got a partner that we, we've met and we're both looking to do, and we're doing similar size deals in similar areas. And we had just very different skill sets. So I mentioned, I've got an advertising degree, kind of think qualitatively. He's a structural engineer. So he's thinking details and likes, you know, kind of diving in and kind of where's the operations hat. Um, so that's been key. Uh, we talked about property management. You know, we do third party management, but that is probably the single most important strategic partner you have and making sure that you pick a partner that you know, knows your market, knows your business plan. Um, you know, for us, it's important. We've, we've picked a partner that is not huge. I don't want something that's got 80,000 units where I'm, I'm a fly on the wall, um, but you know, that, that has sufficient scale, but that you know, wants to grow with us. Um, and, and just been, you know, building out those relationships as, as we've gone. Have you taken your brother along with you on the, on the journey? He, he is involved. So he's, he's a partner with us and he's, he's helping raise equity. Um, you know, at this point we've done deals in San Antonio where we're, I just got back from Atlanta last week is where, which is where he is. And we are going to start looking at and doing deals in Atlanta. And he's a big part of the reason you know, we obviously like the story and the, the, the jobs and everything happening in Atlanta. Uh, but having him there is going to give us a strategic advantage. So he'll, he'll switch over from you know, 
just from doing equity to also kind of being boots on the ground and sourcing deals. What do you think about the Atlanta market? What are your feelings about it after you visited it? I like it a lot. You know, I think for us, you know, we, we've been a little bit more, I think there's a lot of folks kind of running to secondary tertiary markets. Um, we are not, I think we're, because we are in that sort of five year hold, you know, maybe even a bit longer, um, we can be a little bit more patient and want, want to be in good, big growing markets and be in infill locations. Um, so I like, I like Atlanta, you know, it's got, it's, it's a huge market. There's a lot of sub markets. Uh, there's a lot of, of activity and deal flow, but when you look at, you know, the projections, it's, it's not going to stop growing. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, this is the last question before we go to the short. Um, I want to know what you give your, I guess the listeners, your best tip on raising capital for, uh, for your deals. Uh, the best tip uh, we talked about, I think be intentional with your conversations and be authentic. You know, who are you as a person? Who are you? What are your relationships about? So it, recognize you're, you're in a relationship business. Um, so you need to be intentional and, and have those conversations, but you also need to do it in a way that that's true to who you are. You know, you are not, I joke with some of my buddies that are sales guys, like, Oh, you need to go talk to the guy in sales. Like, but I'm not selling. I'm not. And that's part of me that that's who I am. Um, but it's also, you can't, it, I'm not, I don't have a hard sell. You know, I'd love to work with you if, if you're interested in partnering with us. You know, I think just having those conversations and, and finding out the language that works for you and who you are as a, as a person, you meet your personality. Thank you. Uh, what about on the personal side of things? Is there a habit that you do on a weekly or daily basis that's, uh, that's helped you grow professionally? Yeah, for me, it's, it's weekly planning. Um, you know, so at the beginning of the year, sit down with my wife, we'll kind of map out goals for what's the, you know, the yearly goals. So we'll look at, you know, we have a section for travel. <laughs> we have a section for finances, for relationships. You know, what do I do with my kids? Like one of my kids goals, I want to be a coach. We have a seven year old and a four year old. I want to coach each one of them in one sport each year. So we'll kind of map out that year. And then on Sunday, I spend 45 minutes to an hour looking at this week and what's coming up, looking at my calendar and figuring out marrying those annual goals with what's going on this week and making sure that, you know, it's, I've set the week up to be, to be productive. It's work, man. It is work. Totally. Cause I, son, I do, I do that Sunday mornings and dude, it can go two and a half hours sometimes. Like, yeah. But it's, but it's totally worth it. I'm, I may be slow. Right. I'm not going to say I'm a speed demon at this, but to get it right, I've, I've, you know, many times spent over two hours sitting here, kind of just drink my coffee, you know, messing around, but it is the probably single best thing that I've done for my, uh, self in terms of uh, success, you know, career, personal, personally as well, get things done that way. But yeah, I totally it gives you a compass for the week, right? I mean, without Yellow brick road, man. hours, what would, what would you do on Monday? Start Yellow, answering emails. Yellow brick road, follow it. Yep. And I don't have to think. I like that. Yeah. Um, what, uh, what's the biggest mistake that you made uh, in real estate? Uh, I mean, I, I'd say, I wish I had got started earlier in the, you know, we, we haven't had any major mistakes um as far as you know deals that went horribly bad or you know that there's there's certainly deals we didn't get awarded um not necessarily mistakes but i wish i'd have gotten started earlier and i could you know doing the bigger deals earlier but just in general you know kind of jumped in and, and not let that sort of two and a half years lapse before we went and did our first deal so if you'd have changed anything it would have been it would have been started sooner yeah 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 and not being afraid of of hairy deals you know bigger deals like you yeah. looking for just this easy entry point and there, there's not really an easy entry point. They're never, there's never just like, Hey, I'm going to go buy this thing. Right. Yeah. There's always yeah. a moving part or, okay, here we go. Gina, what you got? Well, you know, it's like everyone says it's not the right time. I'll bring Jay Scott back. Cause it just comes to mind. He started buying flipping houses in 2008. There was tons of deals, but nobody was buying them. You couldn't get financing, but there were deals. Now fast forward to now you can't find deals, but your flush was cash. So my only point to that is it's never the right time. Listen, I got six kids. Was it ever the right time to have the fifth kid? It's never the right time to have a kid. It's never the right time to start a family. It's never the right time to quit your job. You just gotta have the feeling, you gotta have the big reason why you're doing it, and then it's the right time. When you have that reason why you wanna do something, then, it, then it's the time for you. When, when is it the right time for the seventh? <laughs> for me, it's tomorrow. For my wife, I don't know. She's, she's putting it off. I think she's giving me the Heisman. You know what I'm saying, bro? <laughs> You savage, get back. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it is. <laughs> For me, it was, I was ready two years ago, bro. But, you know, <laughs> can't do that. But you know what I'm saying? Like, and that's just, it's just, you have to have the reason why. I mean, like Andrew said it, I didn't want to dive too deep in the beginning, but 
you know, when you fly back, your, your father's sick and you want to reclaim your time and you want to, you don't want to be stuck in that corporate grind. And Jake loves this, that soul sucking life of being stuck in a cubicle that really propels you to do something thinking, thinking outside the box. And it's, you, you have more fear being stuck in a cubicle than having soul sucking life. Right. So that's where that, that's where that, that paradigm shift goes. So just wanted to share it. It, it makes it where failure is not an option, right? When you, when you, when you know what you want to go do, I mean, you talk like I prematurely left my job. I didn't have a hundred percent of my income replaced, but I bet on myself and I bet that I'd be a lot happier and that I'd be successful. I'd find a way to figure it out. And, and, and we have, mm -hmm. that's great. You know, you got your hair cut for this Bahamas trip, didn't you? You like that, huh? Like yeah, no. yeah, yeah. I had to go ahead and bite the bullet. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, Andrew, what, uh, what about a book recommendation? Well, I mean, I touched on it earlier. The first real estate book I read was Gary Keller's Millionaire Real Estate Investor. Um, definitely, you know, got me, got me thinking, kind of got me down the path. I think the other one that, that's been really important for, for me, and you talk about building a team and needing to, to have a team in place is um, Rocket Fuel, you know, which is, you know, kind of talking about and identifying whether you're a, a visionary or an integrator and kind of that whole entrepreneurial systems piece that you need to have, you know, sort oh, of- Oh, those are the EOS guys. Yeah, yes. yeah. Yeah, love. We uh, we had them at the live event last year. They were great. Yeah. Really Rocket. like, yeah, just really solid, you know, figuring out which, who are you. And for me, you know, not I'm not a details guy. And I, I don't know that I'd necessarily call myself a visionary, but in that construct, it, the visionary title fits better than an integrator. Um, so, okay, I need to go find an integrator. And I've found a really good integrator and, and we're, we're working very well together. Have you read Ray Dalio? Uh, Principles? Principles? The shaper. No. Maybe you're a shaper, bro. It's on my, it's on my yeah. list. It's in, it's in my audible right now. <laughs> it's good. I'm really liking that one. Um, what project are you excited about right now? Obviously, the, the one we've got closing here in a couple of weeks, uh, super excited about. You know, it's 253 units. You know, we, we had almost, almost $10 million of equity. There's a lot of value add that we're going to be able to go introduce. It's, it's in a really good area. Um, so super excited to get that one closed and, and uh, add it to the portfolio. Uh, how can listeners get a hold of you? Um, you know, my the company's Wildhorn Capital. So website is wildhorncap.com. My email is just Andrew at wildhorncap.com. Uh, yeah, I would love to love to talk to anybody and and encourage you on your journey. Uh, so feel free to reach out. Very cool. And where the name come from? Uh, so I went to UT, you know, Longhorns. My brother went to Arizona, the Wildcats. And we were just kind of talking one day, like, what do we want to do? And he said, what do you think about Wildhorn? I was like, that's not bad. I like it. You know, the, the last thing you want to do in Austin is be something like Longhorn related because that's everything. But uh, that just, <laughs> Well, I've noticed a lot of you Texas guys got horns in your names. So I'm just I'm trying to understand. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, that's cool, man. Andrew, where did you meet your partner? Um, we we, we met at, at a real estate conference, just out kind of networking, talking, um, looking at, it, I wasn't necessarily looking for a partner at the time. We just kind of hit it off and chatted and, and realized, you know, stayed in touch, realized we were very complimentary. We were trying, doing similar things in similar places and uh, kind of took off from there. Uh, Jake, it was, it was out being out there. Uh, my, this is my last shameless plug for the day. It's the 22nd shameless plug. We have a live event in October. If you're looking to meet a partner, if you're looking to network, if you're looking to raise capital, if you're looking to meet Jake and I, if you're looking to talk to a syndication attorney, if you're looking just to listen to stories and be inspired for the weekend, not just ours, go out to live events. That's where you meet people. That's where you find money. That's where you network. This job, like you said, is all about relationships. So October 6th and 7th in Nashville, we're going to be there. I know Andrew's going to be there because his partner is emceeing the event. Um, it's going to be a great time. You're going to meet some great people. So um, I hope you guys are out there. October 6th and 7th on the website. Just go take a look at it. And we can think of like a really fun name. Like it's Nashville. There's going to be music, right? It's country. Uh -huh. you know, country guitar partners. Whatever you want to do, man. The, the world <laughs> is there for you. So we can make it happen. Uh -huh. Yes. Man, this has been fun. Um, really appreciate your time today. Gino, Andrew, you guys got anything else? Uh, I just want to thank Andrew for coming uh -huh. on. It's been a great story. Um, listen, I looking forward to meeting you out there in October, really. Uh, and I, you know, wish you luck on this deal and I can't wait, can't wait to you guys find the next one. Yeah. And no, I've enjoyed this conversation a lot. Look forward to seeing you guys and, and it's been fun. We'll, we'll certainly be in touch. Call Sounds this guy good. up, get some of that wild horn cash going, right? <laughs> Make it rain. So, thanks guys. Bye guys. Thanks. Bye.
We trust that you enjoy the Wheelbarrow Profits podcast. Visit jakeandgino.com, your one-stop shop for everything multifamily. See you next time when Jake and Gino share more of their investing secrets with you.